Well, good morning everyone and welcome back to part two of the Prince Eugen build. In this part we're going to um, work on the hull and we're going to complete the hull to its basic stage. That is we'll have the hull painted, we'll have it varnished but we will not put on any of the hull accessories such as propellers, rudders, companionways, uh, boat moorings. What we are going to do is we're going to complete a full hull model and the reason for that is that joy of joys I have now received my replacement lower hull which is beautiful so we're going to complete the vessel as a full hull model and uh, we're going to in this part work on the hull itself we're also going to have a general discussion on the paint program that we're going to use um, really we have to do that very early on because it depends how we handle the hull towards the end of its build. So we're going to start off with a brief chat about the paint scheme then we're going to work on the hull and we're going to complete it through its the hull itself, how we handle the portholes, um, the paint scheme that we're going to use and the outer varnish. Except as I say we're not going to look at the hull accessories. So let's have a quick chat now about the paint scheme. Um, this is the painting and marking guide which Trumpeter have issued and when I had a look through this um, I'm quite happy with the generality of what they've got but I was concerned immediately to look up here and see that the grey which is labelled 305 and is this dark grey stripe on the ship here um, was given a Tamiya equivalent number of XF58. Now XF58 in Tamiya is not a dark grey, it's a dark olive green. And whichever colour the Germans painted their warships during the Second World War, dark olive green was not one of their hull colours. And so that made me think. So I decided to go onto the internet and do a bit of checking and I had a look at paint schemes that were published for the Kriegsmarine during the last war, their, their ordinary paint schemes and their camouflage uh, schemes, and tried to concentrate on the Baltic in 1944-45, and that, in conjunction with this scheme, and with uh, a number of internet schemes, has satisfied me that I have the colours that should be on the Prince Eugen and we'll start from the from the bottom and work our way up. So first of all the anti-fouling red I've decided to use Tamiya's Hull Red XF9. There is then a black line immediately on top of the anti-fouling and that's fairly straightforward, and that is, I'm going to use Tamiya's flat black XF1. Above that, there is this dark grey band, which on the ship um, seems to be on the hull um, below what I think is a line for um, the degaussing cable. And the colour that I've picked out for that is Tamiya's Dark Grey XF24. Above that, and on this paint marking guide, this basically is shown as everything above that dark grey line, including the upper works. But from what I've seen from um, the, the Baltic colour scheme that the... Craigsmarine used, this is not correct. Um, there seems to be a layer for the upper hull which I'm going to put on in Tamiya's Sky Grey XF19. And for the upper works themselves, I have a Craigsmarine German Navy Second World War camouflage set from Life Colour. And the nearest to the upper works, basically from the internet, seems to be um, 
a colour called Hellgrau Deutsches Kreigmarine 50 UA603 from the Life Colour Camouflage series which is paler than Tamiya's Sky Grey Now when I was looking at these various colours um, I did a lot of work with the RGB codes Now the RGB codes are very, very accurate They are six digit codes, letters and numbers and any of you who have Photoshop will be um, aware of them because if you pick out a colour in Photoshop um, down at the bottom there is shown the RGB code for that colour and they are very very specific so I used basically these RGB codes to try and match up the colours that I'd found both on this painting and marking guide and from the internet and these six are the closest I can get to the hull, the black line, the dark grey, the lighter grey and the palest of the greys. There are other colours used, particularly for the Arado and for the ship's boats, and one or two deck colours uh, seem to be a, a darker grey as well, but we'll look at them specifically when we come to them. But it seems to be that these six colours seem to be the best match for the Prinz Eugen in 1944. So that's what we're going to go with, and we'll now have a look in a bit more detail about the painting. The first photograph uh, that we have here shows the replacement lower hull, which has now been delivered from my Chinese supplier. It's in perfect condition and was extremely well packaged prior to dispatch. Um, when I got it, uh, it needed very little done to it, uh, bar possibly just a little cleaning up. The first thing to be done was that I washed it to remove my fingerprints or anybody else's fingerprints and other marks. Um, I think this is quite important when you're painting anything because you get grease from this, your skin transferred onto the polystyrene and when you paint it you can sometimes see fingerprints or whatever on it. And I also think it interferes with paint drying. Um, so it was washed uh, and then I gave it a couple of light coats of primer and that changes its appearance completely. The next thing was to airbrush a narrow black butt line round the top edge of the hull to give the narrow black line between the hull red and the dark grey. This could have been done either on the top of the lower hull or the bottom of the upper hull. But I chose to do it this way as it eases the masking work to be done later on on the upper hull. I made up a mixture of half and half Tamiya's XF1 matte black and XF28 thinners with one drop of Winsor & Newton's Artis Acrylic Flow Improver. I find this makes a real difference when airbrushing and I strongly recommend a flow improver of some sort. Even just a tiny spot of washing up liquid will make a big difference with this as well. A couple of coats uh, roughly applied uh, is all that's needed. Um, I let it dry for about 24 hours and then masked it with a very thin, about one millimeter thin tape. I used a tape that's used by, by vehicle painters to give very narrow pinstripes as I find that the 3mm Tamiya tape is too wide. Next, I airbrushed the remainder of the lower hull with Tamiya's XF9 hull red. A couple of coats gave a decent finish and after 24 hours I removed the masking tape to leave a clean, narrow black line above the red. Moving on now to the upper hull and I then mixed up Tamiya's XF19 light grey as before with thinners and flow improver and airbrushed all of the upper hull. I gave it a couple of coats, allowed it to dry and masked it off to leave the area to be painted dark grey. This I did making up an airbrush mixture as before but using XF24 dark grey this time. You can see the variations of grey in this photograph with the lower hull primed and the upper hull with both dark and light grey. When it comes to joining the upper and lower hull together, I fitted them together and secured it with a few elastic bands. Uh, elastic bands are 
are a thing that modelers or I use anyway a lot of and you can't have enough elastic bands. I then put a spot of polystyrene glue at the bow and at the stern to secure the two parts in place accurately and when they dried I ran a line of Tamiya's extra thin cement along the join between the hull parts. I actually find this extra thin cement quite difficult to get a hold of uh, locally. Um, I had to, um, I can't remember where I bought this, I think it was Australia or, or whatever, it was certainly abroad. Um, but that thin line secured the two halves securely together. Um, but the more observant of you will have noticed a series of black smudges along the inside of the upper hull. This is to do with my method of emphasising the portholes, which is to mix up a little PVA or white glue with some semi-gloss black acrylic paint. This gives a thick, sticky mixture which I plaster on the inside of the hull after I have drilled out the portholes properly. I use a handheld half millimeter drill bit for this. I don't like using a, a, a power drill because it's so small the end that it tends to whip about if you put too much um, speed on it. Um, so I prefer just to get a hold of the drill bit between my fingers and rotate it in the, in the porthole and that clears them out. But the PVA and paint mixture goes right into the portholes and is because the PVA drives clear and the paint dries black, it makes a very good contrast against the light grey of the hull and it emphasises the portholes. I think you can see this on the last photograph. Uh, the last thing now that we're going to do to the hull, um, and it's now completely glued up, um, is that we're going to varnish it. Um, now the varnish I'm going to use is Winsor & Newton's Artist's Acrylic Matte UV Varnish. Now I've never used this before on a ship. Um, I've done one or two tests on uh, polystyrene with these particular paints on it and it looks to come out very well indeed. Um, two reasons for varnishing. Um, first of all, to protect the paint from being chipped or scratched. Um, it obviously won't protect it if you hit it with a hammer or if you drop it from a great height, but it will protect it against the normal kind of wear and tear of everyday use, um, which won't be much because it will be in a display. But um, the other reason is that this is a UV varnish and it will protect the paints from fading in UV light. I don't know how effective it will be, but I thought I'd give this a try anyway. Um, it's quite expensive stuff. There's 125 mLs in here. I'm going to airbrush it, and that cost me £7.55. Now that's in pounds sterling and US dollars. I reckon it would be a, just short of $12, maybe 11, 11.75, something like that. So it's quite expensive stuff, but um, I'm I'm going to give it a go, uh, basically to see how it comes out. I know how it'll come out. It'll come out quite well. Um, but I want to see what the long term effect of it is. A UV varnish is something I've never used before. Um, I hear good reports about UV varnishes in general. So I'm going to try this one. And as I say, I'm going to airbrush it. So, getting my little airbrush uh, over. It, I use it neat. Or I have in the trials I've done. So we're just going to use it neat again. Um, basically because I don't quite know what on earth I could thin it with. It'll no doubt say on the bottle here somewhere, but uh, that's a little. It's a kind of pale milky colour, not, not white uh, as milk, but it, it's pale. So we'll give it a go. i can get my compressor started up. You will probably now not hear me for the compressor, but uh, we'll have a we'll give it a go anyway.
Well, I'm sure that watching this video, um, my fellow modelers will have been wondering if there was any of this stuff actually going on to the model. And that it is very, very difficult even for me to see this going on, and I'm right in front of it. So I'm sure you saw not a thing. But I could in fact see see um, a layer going on but looking at the amount that's still left in my uh, container here there's not very much but it is going on I could see a faint sheen over parts of it that were just being um, sprayed so I am hopeful that all is going well here Also, if I touch it, it's almost, but not quite, touch dry. And I didn't really mean to touch this paint because I'd hope to keep it clear of any uh, grease from my skin. Because that, I, in my experience, um, interferes with paint drying. Um, I'm going to give this a couple of minutes and then I'm going to give it another coat because as I say, it's, it's, it, the last bit I did there was slightly tacky, but only slightly. And some of the earlier bits that I did feel touched, certainly feel touched dry now. So I'm going to give it at least one other coat um, and possibly two because there's certainly not very much coming out of the container. so. It's obviously going on very, very thinly. Uh, I did watch a, a video by, um, and I can't remember who it was now, but another modeler who had used the, exactly the same varnish. And uh, the advice from him was to put on two very thin coats. Well, that's one certainly very thin coat that's going on, and we'll give it another one and see... Um, I'll be able to tell from the amount that's in my bowl here how much is actually going on, but I can assure you it is not a lot. So we'll give that a couple of minutes and then I'll coat it again. Um, we've now finished the hull of the Prince Eugen. Um, the last photograph showed you, I hope, that the UV varnish uh, seems to have grown fine and uh, the, the hull is now ready for the next stage that will happen to it. But I don't propose to do that next. Um, my view about warships is that they have a purpose. And that purpose is to get the principal armament within range of an enemy and to use it. And so, out of the normal order of things. Uh, in the next uh, video we're going to have a look at the, the armament of the Prince Eugen. We're going to have a look at the main 8 inch rifles and their associated turrets and barbettes. We're going to look at the secondary armament which is I think 110 millimeter. Well, no doubt a caption will come up underneath me to tell me differently. Uh, we're going to look at one or two of the 40 millimeter weapons um, we're not going to look at the torpedo tubes though, uh, we'll keep them for a later date. But certainly we're going to do the 8 inch arm, uh, rifles, their turrets, etc. Um, the main secondary armament and we'll make at least two of the 40mm mounts. Um, and that will all come along in part three and I look forward to seeing you there.